Okay, so Harry, great to have you back on the show. Now I'm gonna start by quoting you. All right? oh I know you love that. So I'm gonna <laughs> quote you, and you said, and I'm gonna quote, Bragg has just decided, when I say Bragg, obviously I'm referring to New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg, has just decided that now is the time. And I think if Bragg has made the decision, this is not an exploratory grand jury. He's got to be going for the kill. Discuss with my listeners. Happily, although Twitter, man, or like email, it's like you just write stuff up and then they read it back to you. You better be precise. But this is one I would certainly live by. Look at the whole sort of tortuous path that Bragg took. He came uh, into office. And he, there's a little bit of a revision going on now. I think it's pretty clear he was just, you know, timid or not ready to take on the the big, go for the big hit um, when he started and he smothered the case. Um, and uh, there were a few words of maybe will we'll, uh, the investigation remain open, but nobody really believed it. And he, that was one of two or three kind of uh, bad. Uh, he sort of stepped in it early on in a few ways and had to regain his footing. But then he brought the criminal uh, action against the Trump organization and uh, he took a victory lap. And New York Times was writing about, you know, he's gotten his stride back, et cetera. He's got, you know, he's got his mojo back. Then he starts this special grand jury. Imagine for a moment, a thought experiment, that he does all this and then once again says, eh, I just wasn't, you know, I, I think, and, and by the way, he's also brought, yeah, he, he uh, Pomerantz and Dunn quit, but he's brought in some other hot shots, et cetera. Uh, he went through this war of words with uh, Pomerantz when the book came out last week about you know, there just wasn't enough evidence now, but suggesting that they've since uh, put it together. I just, you know, he is a politically minded guy. I just can't see his going through this exercise and then uh, folding up his tent. So I think that he's he's going uh, all in. The only the only question, the only way, I, the only sort of counterpoint that gave me some pause at that, Michael. He, there, everyone uh, points out he's got some more pressure to apply to 75 year old Helen Weisselberg. Can the guy take any more? Uh, but it sounds like a pretty solid insurance fraud case against Weisselberg that would bring a few years. He's now serving his months at Rikers, which is such a hellhole. The only con uh, perplexing thing to me is why didn't why didn't he go all in against Weisselberg trying to, to uh, push him as much as he could before uh, he got the grand jury together? But my view, and I know you're in a delicate position here because you're part of the investigation and can't discuss it. But my view of Bragg from the outside, it's about it's based on that, not the evidence is if he's you know going publicly in a special grand jury he, his strong intention is to indict so i've already stated before the press yeah that i am going back yeah. this upcoming week for the 16th time and let's just break only down the, the second with bragg though right or second no or this will be bragg? this will be the third with bragg exactly yeah, okay. so three times is when i was in otisville 10 times with Pomerantz and team. Uh, and then this would be the third time with Bragg and team. And a lot of people, a lot of journalists have called and asked me, um, the fact that you're going back so soon, isn't that a pretty strong indication that Bragg isn't fucking around, that this is a guy who's really now on a mission in order to do what he said that he was going to do when running for office of the district attorney, yeah. and that is to hold the rich and powerful accountable. And obviously, we all know who he was talking about at the time, considering he also mentioned him by name. You, you agree <laughs> that, with that? That was a good clue, right? Yeah, right. Do, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, you agree with that, Harry? 
That, 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 yeah, I mean, that's my that's my take. And again, I know you're in a delicate position. I wonder if you can sort of surmise. And I'd be interested, by the way, in hearing about your meetings with Pomeranz. That doesn't feel like ancient history. But yeah, I'm just thinking, again, what it lo- and I'm sure he thought about it, what it looks like if he now says, you know, never mind and meekly tiptoes away. Man, oh man, that, you know, I think that's, after everything that's got happened, kind of a career killer, right? I, I don't think, I think that would, you know, he, that would be the end of his DA. Well, his, this term would be all he would serve, I think. So, um, you know, it's my take. It's more of a political than a legal take. I, you know, it was obvious back then and notwithstanding Pomerantz out there, with the sound bite that I think is really about selling books that anyone else would be indicted in a flat second. It's obvious this was, you know, robustly discussed differences of opinion. Pomerantz himself called it a 70% case. And, you know, it really has to do with how, how strong a case on intent, because we stick a step back. So Michael Cohen did the country a great service in revealing the MO that we've since learned is a lifetime of criminal and otherwise shabby conduct by Trump organization and Trump, which is you uh, lowball stuff when you're trying to uh, shaft the government on taxes, mm-hmm. you highball when you're trying to to, uh, to take loans, et cetera. This is their whole way of, of doing business. It's the reason Pomerantz was trying to put together a racketeering case about all those uh, years. So now it comes down to that part is easy showing the um, valuations. And even as a paper case, as a prosecutor, it's not a boring case. You put those two pieces piece of paper next to each other in a jury, they can see it. And now, you know, what happens when Trump or his lawyers say, I didn't know it was all the uh, the lawyers or the accountants, et cetera. In other words, the, the nut to crack, if you're worried, is, is about his intent um, you know, you said, uh, you know, in the, in your, from your very first testimony, he know nothing happens without his okay and, and approval. And that's a really, you know, big piece of the puzzle, but to the extent they are hesitant about making the case on your back alone, the question is what else does he you know, have intent wise? I just want to quickly finish it because sure. we don't know it yet. But uh, I just think they got to think they can make it because I just I just don't think Bragg go, go takes this step into that that pond unless he's prepared to cross it. Sorry, go ahead. So it's interesting that you say that because on I think it was Katie Fang's show yeah. uh, a couple of days ago, she had an attorney on uh, with her and his feeling was Michael Cohen's not going to make a good witness. Michael Cohen is a convicted felon. He's a convicted perjurer, right? It's almost like this guy's right out of Trump's playbook, right? Which is, you know, call people names, try to discredit them, that they cannot use him or rely upon him as a witness. Now, I wonder if he would say the same thing after yesterday's opening statement by um Congressman Jamie Raskin before the committee yeah. on uh, weaponization of the Department of Justice. I wonder if he'd say the same thing. But what's your opinion on that? Yes, I pled guilty. And as you know, because we've talked about it both on air and off air, even if you read my sentencing memo, which most people have not, not only I'm talking about people like him, but I'm talking about journalists that were so fast to denigrate me and to castigate me in the eyes of the public, if they would have read the sentencing memo, I think that they would understand that not everything that you see is accurate. How do you think that I would fare as, let's just say, if I was the lead witness, right? Um, Especially in light of, for example, the Stormy Daniels. And let me just bring up one additional thing, because I'm sure my listeners are probably thinking the same thing. I certainly recall there was a guy by the name of Sammy the Bull Gravano who was like the lead witness in the trial against John Gotti. 
and somewhere along the line, the jury, he, he the had, country, he had some everybody. Issues. Yeah, yeah right. don't you think? I mean, you're talking Couple about a guy who was a convicted. A and not only was he convicted, he's a confessed killer for you know for hire. My specific lie, as you may recall, was the number of times that I spoke to Trump about the failed Trump Tower Moscow project. I stated to the Senate that I spoke to Donald about it three times, when in reality, I spoke to him about it 10 times. Now, if that's the lie that should prevent me from ensuring that our democracy continues to ensure that Donald Trump and others are held accountable, I don't know how anybody else is ever going to be a witness either. By the way, Andrew Weissman put Sammy the Bull on. And it's, it's quite a story. Okay, so we're friends. So let me let me go be be straight with you. Um, look, you have I think made a very strong case for your uh, credibility over the last many months, and I think pe- the people listening here believe you. Nicole Wallace, you and I are on there together once or twice a week. Believes you, and there's an overall. I think very credible story that just coheres for why you were you lied then and why you're telling the truth now. All that is correct. But you are a problematic witness because you have to you just have to think about this. You're the, just what you said. You're the guy. You're the lead witness and you and you just must um funnel it through the, you know, nasty brass knuckle cross-examination of a very strong, you know, kind of uh, snide defense attorney. And the question is, and, and again, you know, the stakes are so high, can they get one juror to say, you know, God, maybe I have a reasonable doubt because of Cohen. Um, so you're not an ideal. I grant with- you, I grant you yeah. that. But at the same point in time, any half decent defense attorney can turn around and find anything on anyone. Anyone. I don't care who you are, including if you were Mother Teresa. It would make no difference. I am certain that yeah. there is something well- in every single person's past that would be enough to put that into the mindset of someone now let me just well just just welcome to my world or my old world you're prosecuting so many advantages but that's right you're thinking what kind of sophistry can make some one member of the jury even though it's like you know and that's that's the flip side of the you know advantage that the government has sorry go ahead so if you turn you who acknowledged that not only did i tell the truth but at the same point in time Um, Everything I said was accurate, backed up by either documentary evidence or by corroborating testimony as well, right, as um, as well as providing information that was relevant to all of their investigations. So let's start with Mueller stated it. They even two individuals from Mueller's team came to my sentencing, never expected to see I would end up with a six year sentence. Three years alleged incarceration, three years supervised release. On top of that, you had seven different congressional or eight different congressional committees that I had spoken to, obviously including, rest in peace, the Honorable Elijah Cummings, everything that I said. Do you realize that not one person has turned around and said, post any of my hearings, and again, I did seven or eight of them, I'd have to actually count, each one went for eight, nine hours. So you're talking about, you know, 56, 60 hours, give or take, of testimony before congressional members, half of which fucking hate you with a passion. Don't you think that if I had lied to them again, it would have been all over the news? How about the New York Attorney General, our unsinkable Tish James, who's not only is she right there with a 200 plus page lawsuit against Trump organization and Donald and so on. But she credits the whole thing based upon me and my testimony. The New York District Attorney's case, 
um, against the Trump add, yeah. organization. So while I acknowledge that I pled guilty to a thousand and one violation, I do I do truly believe that the problem <laughs> that I could see Alvin Bragg's office having with me is that I'm not one who's prepared to take a lot of shit from defense counsel. Well, that's a, that's regards, a whole other thing. And that's a whole other thing. thing. So your, I gotta, your, your, your demeanor is a win. But let me add another thing, an even bigger thing for you as a witness. Sammy the Bull Gravano, they said not only did he commit a murder for hire, he had every motivation. He was he was basically taking a walk on heinous crimes. You're done. Uh, and you've got no people right. can. Yeah, you've got an axe to grind because you you know, he he treated you like shit for a career or for many years. But um, they nobody can point to you at the table and say wh what you're getting from this. You're getting nothing. You're just telling the I truth. Got nothing, I got nothing. I got nothing. That's right. Since day number you're, one. Well, no, nothing. No, before it could have been. You served. And that's the biggest uh, kind of, of um, you know, Rebut I mean, of, uh, impeachment yeah. motivation uh, yeah, of yeah. a normal witness. But what you and I are now doing, Michael, is the rebuttal argument. You'll you know, the government gets up and says why he's guilty. The defense gets up and tries to trash you like crazy. And the government then has its final argument and explains why you can believe everything that you Cohen have said, A, because it's corroborated, but B, it's not like you're getting anything out of it. So look. Um, it's also the case, let's just say this, you know, by looking at it clearly, you've read the, uh, you know, the, the, the Pomerantz book, obviously people who wanted you to succeed, who had that were in there talking seriously about what it's going to be like when you're there, et cetera. And we don't want to poo poo all of them. You're absolutely right, though. This happens in case after case after case in a U.S. attorney's uh, office. But, um, you know, there is also the, the you know, this point about Trump intent. Let me put it this way. And again, this goes to my kind of one point that I'm perplexed about. Man, it would sure be good. I mean, even your testimony, Michael, is large. Stormy Daniels, it's a little different. But basically, it's Stormy Daniels, you know, you've got him. If they believe you, he's dead. But basically, you're saying Trump always controls. He's a micromanager. A guy like Weisselberg has chapter and verse of individual transactions. Do you remember when you signed that? Where was Trump? You know, whereas yours is more general the way he ran well, the company. Well, I think you have to- It would well, really think... behooves them to get, at, you know, to solidify this part of the case. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, but I do have to say that Weisselberg didn't sign a, do a goddamn thing, well, except for maybe a couple of small checks for 50 bucks, 80 bucks, or $200. Um, when Donald- was not president. When he went to the I office see. of the presidency, he then became um, obviously the trustee over the Donald J. Trump. Wait, wait, wait. Trust. So it was Donald who signed the Trump? I mean, who knows the best? You know the truth from behind the scenes. I was there when, they, when he would say... sign every, every single check. You don't have to ask me. I have copies of the checks, which I've already given to Congress. Well, I've this given is to Stormy the Daniels, right? This is Stormy Daniels alone. But yeah. every single check that they will pull from the bank will be signed. It's the most unusual thing that a guy as busy as Donald Trump, a guy yeah. as rich and successful, signed everything himself. Look, I even have old contracts on properties that I bought in the year 2000 yeah. that was in a Trump building. He signed his name 12 different times on three sets of contracts for the sale of an apartment. He signed his name to everything. He'd spend all day long sometimes just signing checks. Signing. Believe well, me. Well, let me ask Alvin you. So Bragg, this is sort of news to me in terms of the evidence. So let's take a really uh, lurid example. You know, the expansion of just the square footage of his apartment by, by three. That was signed somewhere that this is how many square feet it is. Was that signed by Trump himself? Do you Or do you yeah. know? I mean, dating so, back... I, I, so again, let me just not get into any of the specifics, except okay. for the fact that this may not have required a signature for anything. This was uh, a totally different scenario, 
You know, it it wasn't an issue. Oh, let's change ten thousand to thirty thousand or eleven thousand to thirty three thousand. Yeah. There would never be a signature for that. However, when things were done, um, he would sign off on it by putting either his initial or writing Donald. Like for example, if I wanted a check yeah. cut, I would turn around. Let's say oh, Harry Littman presented back. a bill. Yeah. Yeah. I Harry Littman presented a bill for something he did for the Trump org, and I was the contact person working with you. And let's say the bill was ten thousand dollars. So I would so I would then have to take that invoice right at the bottom, approved, sign my name on that, so Trump knew that I looked it over, and that way he would then turn around and then if you know have the check cut and then sign the check himself. Only he signed. So for the for ninety nine percent of all the checks were signed by him. So, so let me just uh, so in general, this whole period then it's not just Stormy Daniels. You're the guy in the room, basically, if they want to go for the insurance fraud, the tax fraud, you, you know, you you're the you're the person. Yeah. So let me yeah. say this to you. When it came to the insurance, yeah. uh, there was we had something that we called the gang of four at the Trump org. And I've discussed this um, publicly, yeah. so it's not new news out there. But it was called the Gang of Four. It was myself, Alan Weisselberg, CFO, Matthew Calamari, the chief right. operating officer, and a guy named Ron Lieberman, who used to work for the city, for the parks, that it was the four of us would handle all of the insurance issues and so on. The rest I won't discuss on uh, at this moment in time, but rest assured, Corroborating testimony is not difficult to have. Let's not forget that there are dozens of insurance companies that would come in and take a look at all of the documentation so that they could put in their bid uh, or they could hear what we're looking for from the group. Remember, no one insurance company did anything at the Trump org because the the level of insurance coverage was so high, like $200 million for terrorism. That was probably parceled out by six or seven. It's called stacking, where yeah. you know you have the first one million, one million that goes to five, five to 20, 20 to 100, and then 100 to 200. And each one takes, of course, a different piece of it based upon what risk they are interested in having. There are plenty of people that saw all the documents. There are plenty of people that could be brought in to testify. I think Alvin Brake has a very good case. I side with Mark Pomerantz on this part that I do believe that a case could have been brought a year ago. But as I also say, I side with Alvin Bragg to the po only to the point that Alvin Bragg is the DA. He's the guy who has to feel secure in bringing the case forward. And he was relatively new. He was seven weeks as the DA. And I don't think he felt that he had enough information that he was comfortable enough and decided that he was going to put the brakes on this thing, slowly reevaluate it, get himself situated into the office. But like you, and again with your quote, now is the time. Right. And he's made the decision. But, you know, Harry, let me just move on for a second. And I just want to say this. one thing before you move on, because maybe that's the maybe he's decided from all you say, I can build this case with Cohen. You know, I don't yep. I don't I don't and need others the other, the other guy. and and others yeah. and documentary evidence and so on. So yeah, let me yeah, ask which you this. there always was, but not new. Yeah, go ahead. Agreed. So do you think that James Carville is out of line when he called Marjorie Taylor Greene, George Santos, Lauren Boebert, and a few others white trash after the State of the Union? Because Carville claims that he has a degree in white trashology. Exactly. But should we keep, right? White trashology is great. But should we keep goading these bad behaving Republicans or do we just leave them alone and let the public decide and judge for themselves? And one last part of this. Further, do you think that the theatrics of the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the like lowers the reputation of the entire Congress? So the last one, there's no doubt about. So I have, you know, you can think of it two ways, as sort as which is I always feel, you know, I think of myself as trying to be not too partisan, but of course I'm a I'm a Democrat. It seems quite clear, Michael. And this is really interesting. 
the White House had a strategy going in to goad her. And they and they so it was actually there were some lines in there and they anticipated it. And I think David from, you know, put it like a boxer uh, getting ready for the the counter punch. And, you know, so I thought, um, you know, I don't have James uh, Carville's uh, color, <laughs> uh, colorful turns of phrase, nor his specific PhD, but white trash. That's about I mean, look. This is the sort of thing, you know, you get spanked for, you know, it's like this, this is like 12 year old juvenile delinquent stuff. Of course, it lowers the reputation of the whole Congress. And it just looked, you know, like I mean, she she looked like like, I, you know, a, a total brat and, uh, you know, extremely not at all a serious legislator right now. And that plays it's there. She's in a very interesting position, as is the Republican Party. She wants to do this it, for in her ruby red district and with the MAGA faithful. That's all she cares about. And going on Fox TV, it's all to the good. But it gets the party as a whole. I mean, you know, no more than the 30 percent that guarantees a loss. But you saw, right, Kevin, Mac I thought it was really telling as to McCarthy and, yeah. and his general weakness. He like shush them and that's all he could do. And then he backed away. You can see who's in charge. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene said it. I, um, the speaker supports me and I support him who, you know, that the Freedom Caucus is in charge there. Do I wish it were otherwise? Of course I do. On the other hand, so many problems we have, as best as I can tell, will not um, recede until there's some kind of root and branch uh, transformation of the Republican Party and some kind of recognition within it. And if it takes that kind of going deeper and deeper into the cesspool, as they're doing, to somehow come out on the other side, all the better. It's, it's totally clear that, you know, the... Um, the screaming uh, and haranguing of the newspapers, et cetera, just are music to their ears. It's more liberal elite stuff to them. So even just thinking about it in terms of how do how how do we actually get out of this mess? You know, some in some ways the the you know the the more degraded they are at some point, the the you know the the party elite. You saw Mitch McConnell basically upgrade Rick Scott. You know, at some point, somebody's going to make some sense in the Republican Party, and and this this shit's going to get weeded out. And you know, the, the the day can't come too soon for the health of the country. So in that in that way, you know, bring it on in a sense. I think. Yeah, she totally. Except that, totally. I got, is, I got a problem. Know, under, with, undermines her. Undermines the party. Yeah, I yes, got. I, I got go a problem. I got a problem with the whole, you know, yeah. screaming out by her of liar, liar. Look, yeah, I, she, she, I, I listen to a lot of the prognosticators and a lot of yeah. the, you know, the hosts of these shows, and they're all like, you know, I can't believe that this guy didn't stand up and applaud. I, fuck that. Honestly, yeah. Harry, fuck, fuck that shit. If you don't want to stand up, don't stand up. That's okay. Right. Everybody has a right to believe what they want. And so plenty of people got up and clapped for what President Biden was saying. And then, of course, many of the most, if not all of the Republicans. Yeah. The part that bothered me a lot was the screaming and the heckling. Liar, liar. You know, that to me, do you remember that happened under Obama, too, uh, in his second term when he was. Oh, but um, what a contrast. First of all, he stood up and said, you lie, which is different from a liar. But the entire he had to apologize. And he did. Right. The The room was mortified here. They express she dressed for it. I mean, she probably, you know, in, in, in rehearsal in her office was, you know, uh, play, was sort of practicing the line. Yeah, it's night and Look, day. She wanted. Right? Come on, Harry. She wanted to come in with a big, giant white balloon like she's going to the fucking circus. All right. Yeah, to be honest with you, is. it's, yeah, it's right. stupid. You got George Santos there yawning with his mouth wide open like a crocodile. I mean, 
Personally, I, I wish to God I was there. I would have taken like a one of Trump's fucking McDonald's double cheese Big Macs, whatever <laughs> they call it, and rammed it right down his fat fucking throat. I can't. That would have helped for your him. credibility in the uh, Brad case. Why? <laughs> what does that have to do with my credibility that I can't well, stand him? You know, yeah. either no, you're no, telling no, the, the, the truth. Or I'm you're talking not. about the cheeseburger, the the TV yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah, that would. No, well, look, I 100 you know agree. What? It's beyond, it's beneath contempt, and, you, you know, the floor has gotten, you know, it was like, what what used to be shocking is now, like, like the norm. Uh, you know, nothing. It's expected. No, it's worse yeah. than the norm, as you say. The, 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 to compare the 2008 episode with this, the, you know, this the, the, this was like, mud, the, you know what it reminded me of? You ever watch wrestling as a kid, the sort of fake villains with the, you know, and they're going, oh, beating no. their chests and being you know what, as Harry, to me, they can. Harry, yeah. you know what it reminded me of? Parliament. I like to watch. Yeah, but, I right. like to watch that Parliament fun, yeah. in in the, in England, and I've actually gone. I I know I know a guy fun, yeah. quite well who's a member of Parliament there, and I went. And we yeah. watched when the last time we were in England, and I have to tell you. They yeah. yell, they scream, they <laughs> they true. do it in that British way. But that's <laughs> their system, and good yeah. for them. But we that's not our system. Yeah. And the fact is, that's what's turning into. It's what's going to happen next. They're going to start coming with eggs and tomatoes and, and the rest of that shit <laughs> know, and start throwing stuff. And then all of a sudden, every member of Congress is going to have to get padded down for eggs and stuff when they're coming right. through the halls. Let me tell you, what they're doing is they're creating a shit show that's only going to have repercussions far beyond their actions for everyone. It's like the idiot who put a wick in his shoe and now everybody has to take their shoes off when they go right. you know, to the oh, airport. That's a, that's a every great single magic. member, yeah. every member is going to have to be patted down for eggs or something to ensure that they don't throw anything at the president. But you know, Harry, but the American we talking, people agree with you, you know. I mean, that, yes. that's the thing. It really, yeah, but that, it's such an interesting time politically for that party. Because they keep doubling down and doubling down on things that the that the country doesn't like, but work in their sort of micro political, uh, you know, environment. Yeah, the universe. So, look, since yeah. we were talking about Alvin Bragg again, I think yeah. when you talk about Alvin Bragg, I think it's only right and fair to talk about our New York Attorney General Tish James mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. talk about her civil case into Trump's finances. The new deposition footage that came out last week was fucking spectacular, right? You could see this. Could you imagine him as a witness and you're cross-examining him? He is the worst person to depose because he's a gigantic baby. He cannot take someone asking him questions. But during that deposition, dear old Donald pled the fifth over 400 times while under oath. And that's about the smartest thing that the lawyers had him do because Donald lies again with impunity and guaranteed they would have been bringing him up on perjury charges right now as of today. So if you would, Harry, with your expertise and your brilliance, tell us why you think that invoking the Fifth Amendment can and will ultimately be used against him in that civil case. Yeah, I mean, I was really big on this and I remain, you know, I you've been in trials. There's just nothing like seeing it come out of the mouth of the wind. Now in criminal trials, as you know, somebody pleads the fifth, the jury can't even hear about it. That's part of the Fifth Amendment protection that you can't incriminate yourself uh, without, uh, you know, uh, be forced to incriminate yourself. He's in a civil case and, you know, it's sort of incriminating, but not in the way the law insists. So if each one of those, and that's why, by the way, he was so low energy is that he got woodshedded by the lawyers before. Don't, don't mm -hmm. go into history. Honest. Every single one of those can be played for the jury. And not only can it be played for the jury, it can be argued to the jury that the mm -hmm. reason he took the fifth was because he knows He's guilty, and if he told the truth, it would cut against him. So Tish James, who, by the way, you're so right, the, her her huge complaint, it's actually the source, and this is clear uh, in the Pomeranz book, of much of what she's really developed a lot of the evidence that, that could uh, – you know, hang him in the in the on the criminal side. But but back to her, this, there's a trial. It's scheduled for October. 
The judge shows every intention of wanting to keep it till October. They will come in and again and again show these sort of differences of evaluate uh, valuation, and then have Trump play play the Trump plead the fifth. So you have this evidence. Then he pleads the fifth, and you have a preponderance standard, not a beyond a reasonable doubt. A jury just has to decide. It's more likely than not that he knew that. Um, he, uh, you know, would would uh, he he knew about the valuation differences, and you have under his uh, from his own lips. I don't want to tell you the truth about this because it might tend to incriminate me. You know that, and 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 the consequences here. All right, it's not a criminal trial. He won't uh, see jail time, and you and I could have a longer discussion about whether he will see jail time, even if he is convicted on criminal side. But man, it's a. Other than that, it is a you know a, a sledgehammer coming at him, a huge, huge, maybe ruinous fine, and then complete loss of the control of the company. And that's not just for him, but for the kids. You know, this is this is now the, I'd say the main event. It, you know, there will be indictments soon, but this is big time uh, coming at him like you know like a freight train. Yeah, what they're going to do is they'll ultimately, I don't believe, you know, she, uh, when I say Tish James is looking, they said, as a base of $250 million. I want people to remember, that's a base. I believe yeah. that it'll be more into the neighborhood of $700 million, and he doesn't have that cash. Right. Unless, of course, the Saudis or someone else bails him out. But the interesting thing with Donald, he's so stupid. Well, wait, you were about to say, you were making a prediction about what was going to happen in that trial, did I? I, yeah, was really I believe that it, yeah, I believe it'll be about $700 million and they'll oh, shut the company. And they'll shut the yeah. company down. They'll revoke the charter within which to operate in the state right. of New York. And I, okay. I believe that they will seize the assets in New York. And sell them off in order to. And cover. the trial will happen, right? It'll happen. Oh, absolutely, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Now, here's the funny thing, too, because he's so stupid. He truly believes that he could bullshit his way out of this. So, what does he do? He tells this lawyer Fischetti, right, that he needs to go onto the record and tell the all the newspapers that Donald wanted to talk, and that. He had to talk Donald out uh, of answering questions when he was being deposed by the attorney general's office. So Fischetti comes out with a, you know, with a statement. He absolutely wanted to testify. And it took some very strong persuasion <laughs> by me and some others to convince him. Now, then what does Trump do? Because again, on his feet, he can't speak. Because Everything he says, well, that's, that, that was the point I was getting to, but thanks for ruining it for my listeners. Oh, right? Everything, I'm sorry, everything that, everything that he says. It's your show, besides. I appreciate I that. <laughs> so everything that he says ultimately turns out to be a lie. And he knows that if it's written in paper and it's under oath, he knows that he's in trouble. So then what does he do? He has everybody get together and they put together a lengthy statement slamming, of course, Tish James. Because that's what he does. First, he denigrates, and then they denigrate some more, and then they try to put it in the press, and then they use that in order to build it. I've been down this road before. I've seen the play. I've helped to create that playbook. It's not going to work with her. So he turns around and he writes, I once asked, if you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? Now I know the answer to that question. Ah, oh, Nachamo, the guy finally gets some seichel, right? Finally, he gets some brains into this. And, he, and I quote here, when your family, your company, and all the people in your orbit have become the targets of an unfounded, politically motivated witch hunt, supported by lawyers, prosecutors, and the fake news media, you have no choice. By the way, I agree with that statement wholeheartedly. You know who else does? Congressman Jamie Raskin, when he made the almost a similar statement yesterday to the weaponization of the Justice Department. And... The, to that committee. I totally agree. But what if you're the motherfucker who's actually the guy that's been behind the whole thing? <laughs> so he knows that anything that he says is going to be a lie. And so he has decided that he's not going to answer any questions. And in that somber sort of angry man baby that he is, what does he end up doing? He ends up the fifth 
Yeah. You take the fifth. Same the fifth. Same fifth. Same fifth. Same Except, same, Michael, the non-answers, the non-answers will be evidence, and it's not simply same answer. The very thing you were saying, let me add the, the other point he made. Anybody in my position would be an absolute idiot if they didn't take the fifth. How do you think that's going to go over with the judge? So the yeah. jury's going to hear, <laughs> I am such a big right. shot. I am so right. rich that if I didn't take the fifth, meaning I didn't, if I gave you truthful information, because that's right. what he's not doing, right? He's not answering the question. I, right. I, you know, I, I don't think that's going to have great jury appeal right there. And they'll play it. So let me ask you this then. The, the yeah. Department of Justice has yeah. really, I mean, they've taken their sweet time in terms of indicting Trump on anything. But here comes the 2024 election to complicate everything, which, of course, is why he filed that two-page document. And now I heard he's hired Jason Miller, another genius amongst geniuses, right? I mean, the guy was a, literally, he was a booking secretary when I was there. Now, all of a sudden, they're making a big issue about Jason Miller, right? It's unbelievable. How much time do you think that they have left to legitimately pursue a case against Trump before the election cycle makes it near, you know, makes it nearly impossible? Is it your opinion that they would indict Trump even if he is the nominee or somewhere in the midst of the election? Yeah, so my answer to that one is yes, and that matters to your first um, answer because I think you gotta assume, and they gotta assume, if they indicted tomorrow, a jury would be impaneled like in a year. Um, and, you know, it's a very tricky thing. They're not supposed to take account of politics, but th that's almost not even politics for the prosecutors. That's just this huge, you know, practical uh, fact that bears on things. But so but first and foremost, yeah, I don't think they see themselves as bound by, you know, the heat of the of a political season or anything like that. So there and there's no principle there that 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 says so you know there are certain moves you can't make be near an election but th there's no reason in in doj principles that a that a uh, candidate can't be also a um, defendant i think that's the terms they're thinking in however you know let's say we take that year so and now we get to november i mean it is um it's one thing to for uh, uh, to prosecute a candidate, you know, in, in in campaign season. It's another a president elect. So it, so when you if you actually ponder the possibility that he runs and wins, seems like a long shot, but seemed like a long shot in twenty fifteen, didn't it? Um, that's that that gets you to complete imponderable end of the republic kind of uh, scenarios. So um, and even and even if they brought it tomorrow and they tried him in a year and they convicted him, we'd still be in some kind of post, you know, conviction appeal and whatever. They've almost bought that for certain. So I'll just say in order for it not to be, you know, it's a it's kind of a disaster if the trial is happening, you know, October, November. And he's a candidate. He's the candidate. That's you know, then that's, a of course, a big if so, what that means to me is they're really hurting and they are hugely handicapped themselves and they know it if they don't bring charges by, say, you know, April, ASAP, May, uh, right. something like that. So, Harry, you may remember, I think we were on Nicole Wallace. This is going yeah. back a while, right? When the uh, documents were being taken from yeah. Mara Lardo, um, yeah. pursuant to this, to, pursuant to the FBI raid. And I turned around and I was asked the question, why do I think he had those documents? Why do I think they didn't take them back? And I said he was going to use them as like a get out of jail free card or he's selling them, you know, to Saudi or China or North Korea or what or whomever. Right. But I have an I have a question for you. I, I know that and it does everybody because we all saw it on television. The FBI searched. You know, Mar a Lado, you know, Mar a Lardo, uh, and so on. And I don't believe that they searched any of 
Trump's other properties, which is what I had said to Nicole. We should create a map like where's Waldo? Where did Donald go? Which one of his properties did he go to? Was he in the Vegas property? Was he at uh, the Doral? Did he go to the D.C.? Did he go when I say D.C.? I'm talking about his golf club, Seven Springs, to his apartment. Why didn't they search all of Donald Trump's properties yet? Yet they've managed to search more than, you know, Biden's residence. They searched, I think he had a, another home in some other place as well. How come they didn't search all of Trump's properties? So this one is uh, easy, um, probable cause. So they, they could only search under the Fourth Amendment uh, property where they could give fresh evidence uh, you know, that you that there was likely to be, more likely than not to be, evidence of a crime there. And by the way, that's one of the reasons it was so ridiculous for Trump to say, you know, why was it a surprise instead of a surprise? Exactly so that he wouldn't spear it away the evidence. But the other places, I think you can be pretty sure that there might be some around there, but you actually have to be able to pinpoint the specific place where they are and have real probable cause to believe it. Obviously, they had a cooperating witness who was down at we now call it Marl or I'll stick with Mar a Lago and um uh who who gave them evidence that the court signed off on with of course um Biden and Pence, including Pence this morning. Uh we uh-huh. take we'll get to that There's one too. Lo- it's, but it's a voluntary search. They say, you know, it's their, it's to their own advantage. They say, come on in and look at everything. So I can, I you know, for one, if you don't find stuff or things turn up later, it's on you, not me. If Trump were an honest man who were complying with the law, he would have said the same thing. Have at it everywhere, gentlemen. Instead, he does everything he can to obstruct and and he forced them to do the search right. in the first place by lying on the subpoena and they don't they don't have the the goods which are you know not huge but not small the showing you have to make to a magistrate to uh compel the search and and that that's the story for him and the and the story for Biden and Pence are it wasn't compelled it was voluntary yeah um thank god i have you thank god that my <laughs> listeners have you all right so let me ask you this again Once again, Senator Chris Murphy has put forth a bill that will require that the Supreme Court adopt a code of ethics. It's hard for me to imagine that they don't, but now we know for fact that they don't. Equal to the code of ethics that every other judge in the United States is beholden to. So how likely is it that this bill will get any further than the last one half dozen similar bills, right, that he's tried to enact? And why would the high court be resistant to something that could make them look better? Because truth be told, they look like shit these days. Nobody has any faith or belief, and no one has any confidence in the Supreme Court. So two really different questions. The bill, you have to think about 60, et cetera. But, you know, I think the court might well say, even if a bill passes, that, you know, it's unconstitutional because of right. you know, separation of powers, they have the right. So let's so but in any event, they I think maybe we have to think they have to do it on their own anyway. So but we can put set the bill to the to the side. Now, we know this week. I, I think they know they're getting, you know, lambasted. They look terrible. They do say, by the way, we co- we follow these rules, except we don't have to. And there's no consequences if we if we don't. It's almost like, it's, well, I was going to say TV, but it's just like as the as time passes, it's almost generational. You know, the younger justice come in and say, guys, you know, we look terrible, but we know that they, you know, Alito's, Thompson's, the people who have. You know, it's almost related. Remember Alito's sneer a few State of the Unions ago uh, when when Obama yeah. made a statement. You know, it's like yep. he they they take umbrage, and Thomas yep. did the same thing when he said, you know, talking about the leak. They take umbrage at the idea that they should be challenges, and they're not. They either are not um, media savvy or they don't give a shit. Um, but um, the younger justices do. You got to imagine Roberts does. But I think the state of play is not yet because they they met this week. They talked about it and nothing uh, happened. 
It's, I'll bet there's even a question, uh, you know, sort of within within the ranks. Do they need five? Do they need nine? What does it What does it take? They I can't couldn't agree more. They look uh, terrible, and it's got to happen eventually. But I don't think in 2023. Yeah, look, you got Chief Justice Roberts He's supposed to have control over the court. He's the chief justice. He has so little control over this court. And I think one of the reasons is because some on that court don't really see themselves as a court, but more as a political body, right? They're certainly not balanced. They're certainly not fair. I mean, then you have, of course, you know, Robert's half-assed investigation into, what was it, the um, Alito slash Dobbs leak, right? That's a total fucking embarrassment in and of itself, you know? And well, let me. I, I, basically, I, I, let me take a basically, little issue with uh, but your Harry. Premise. But basically, yeah. one second. Well, yeah. no, not yet. But certainly, okay. you know, their <laughs> yeah. numbers, their approval numbers, are yeah. in the single digits. So my yeah. real question to you: Why hasn't Roberts taken any action to sort of right the ship to make sure that they're not seen as a joke, as like the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the law? I mean, one would think so, right? Well, you did lead to where I wanted to go because it's it's actually not so right that the chief justice has all this control. I, I, I Rehnquist used to say, you know, he has all his power is a little sort of disapproving nod. I, you know, he's the chief, but he doesn't he he can't really, you know, uh, make them toe the line. He, I think, you know, is. Uh, mortified at the, and this is apart from results, of course. But he's mortified at the at the terrible public standing of the court. It's abysmal, maybe historically so. You don't really keep those numbers going back then. But you know, he, you can't. You, there's only so much you can do to wrangle an Alito or Thomas, or he does. It so happens that the that the progressives are pretty well behaved here, pretty good citizens. But, you know, there have certainly been instances. Douglas, man, oh, man, he he, he pulled all kinds of shit and, and Warren couldn't do anything about it. So it's just inherently kind of nine, you know, a uh, sort of balkanized nine chambers rather than a, a court that he, he presides over it, but not with any kind of disciplinary power. That's and that's the this that plus the individuals in question tells the story. Yeah. You know, what I find sad right now as every day there's another committee being formed, right? It's another investigation into something, whether it's the documents, whether it's Department of Justice, but the other day, the House is investigating Twitter. Right. And why are they investigating Twitter? Well, it's somewhat the result of this expletive laden Christy Teigen tweet that read, you know, was read somewhere and so on. And my, in my opinion, it exposes really how Trump at the time tried to manipulate Twitter by mm-hmm. wanting the derogatory statement about him taken down. Right. So. As the House supposedly investigates how social media is biased against them, could they end up exposing themselves instead, very much like I'm describing this committee on the weaponization of the Department of Justice? If, in fact, it's not going to be a kangaroo committee or a Mickey Mouse committee whereby they actually want to do something. And my my hope is, like with Jim Jordan leading that committee, my hope is that he actually wants to do this because it benefits America, because it helps the next generation to ensure that they have faith and confidence in the Department of Justice. No different than my hope is that with this investigation of Twitter, that it goes to show you who was actually behind trying right, to manipulate and impede upon this social media platform well keep hope alive my friend but i but you gotta be kidding me that that's what that's what i'm not optimistic i'm hopeful but 
Yeah, but some that keep hope alive. But look, here's what interested me about that. This is the first of what's it going to be? 15 things about Hunter Biden's laptop. But, you know, compare the January 6th committee. They had a long agenda. They came out of the box with some good stuff. They This time they have Twitter up there and they're trying to somehow insinuate that the failure of Twitter, temporary failure, Twitter caught to it, to publish the New York Post article was somehow driven by the FBI or and, and ultimately uh, Biden and Biden's nefarious interests. And you had four witnesses there said one after the other. Oh, no, 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 that never happened. Absolutely not. No, there was zero intervention from the government. So, I mean, you're the chair of that committee that he, you do have the power to who's going to he had to know that. He had to know that they were going to, you know, the whole thing was going to be one big belly flop. But is it just that, you know, all he wants to do is have those words in the water and the um, the 30 or 40 percent faithful won't will we'll forget that the when push came to shove, each and every one of the witnesses disclaimed it and said, oh, no, you're wrong. Nothing there. What a strange kind of especially inaugural he hearing on the subject that obsesses him, Hunter Biden's laptop, and that he hopes will obsess the country. It just seemed a complete whiff. Look, I'm, I'm a firm believer. If, in fact, that there are things on that laptop that, you know, implicate Hunter Biden or anybody for that matter, I don't negate Trump's improper, illegal actions by then saying, well, if Hunter Biden or Joe Biden or anybody else has the same issue, then one negates the other and well, let's just call it, right? It's like uh, two personal fouls in a football game. They negate right. each other, right? right? Two negatives equal the positive. No, not in my book. Everyone has to be held accountable to the same standard. I don't Every care. Every politician, it, Hunter Biden's a private citizen though, but go ahead. Correct. But if he committed a crime, he should then be investigated and indicted and okay. prosecuted and charged if that's what is it correct and accurate. But I don't give, you know, for example, Donald Trump a pass on taking the, uh, the documents because if you took one document, Harry, we'd be doing this podcast with you behind bars, all right? That happens to be the truth. Everyone needs to be held to the same standard. There are not two sets of laws. Now, you know, they may have a reason for why somehow it ended up in there. I don't care, right? Don't take a top secret document like Donald. Don't take over 300. Even like Joe Biden, don't take 15 or 20. The number is not what's relevant to me. What's relevant is the fact that they were in possession of top secret documents. All they had to do is return them, period. I'm not End disagreeing story. with you, Michael, but I just, since we started this with Hunter Biden, I just, the more you learn about the laptop and the, the, the more it's, it's, uh, it seems like a, a dry hole or, or a barely moist one. So I just don't want, you know, you have to, it's important to know that's only going after him, not to vindicate the criminal law, but for, for po nasty political uh, reason. So that that's consistent no, Donald, with what but, you're but saying. Harry, you gotta, Don, yeah. Donald, but Donald said the same thing about Attorney General Tish James, which is why I say each and every person has to be held accountable pursuant to law. But let me move on because I have two real right. fast questions right. for you. Shoot. So lightning right, so round. Smith, I'm ready. We, yeah, we talked we talked about it a second ago. Jack Smith of the DOJ and his special counsel now subpoenaed Mike Pence. Now, if Mike plans to run for the presidency. He's got some real tough choices to make here. So oh. how do you think that he's going to play this? Do you think that Pence will finally tell the whole truth and risk the ire of Trump and his MAGA base? Or does he stick with the whitewash bullshit, right, version of his January 6th that he presented in his book? What do you think he does? Yes, Trump was reckless. He's got to tell the truth, Michael, the, but the really, really interesting, almost like game theory problem is, does he do it now or does he do it later? He can try to delay for a time, but at the end of the day, and I think even with 
this Supreme Court, everything is the, the law is just too strong. There's six reasons why he's going to have to tell. But think about it. Does he want to do it now? Get it over with? Still have the cover of I, they made me do it. And then it's, you know, the political landscape is cleared for him to he's both he's both hurt Trump and he can now go forward with his candidacy. Or does he want to challenge it now for the next eight, 10 months, whatever that sort of hovers over him? And and maybe the testimony comes in the middle of the campaign season. And think about your old boss on this, too. Does he want to try to fight and make it be later? How Or does he uh, want Pence to just say it now? It's a very kind of tricky calculation, I think, for um, both of them. But let me underscore, let me put on my prosecutor and, you know, nerdy pointy headed hat and just tell you if your if your uh, viewers trust me. He's it's 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 a matter of Kenny delay, not a matter of that he, he, he's going to have to testify. And I promise you what he testifies to will not inure to the benefit of Donald. So I believe what you're saying. And I, I agree with you. He will push and it's it those as phone calls. As possible. It's the one on yes. ones he'll have to tell. Yeah. All right. So, Harry, look, as we, you know, you've been on the show before. The hour goes by quick. Last yeah. question. Something that yeah. has really troubled me a lot. And it was watching that uh, Tyree Nichols uh, scenario with the police and, you know, standing him up, hold him up, hold him up as the guy rocked him in the fucking jaw, two, three, four. I mean, come on, seriously? So there are rumors out there right now that at least one of the officers charged with murdering Tyree Nichols might have known him prior. And it's actually been confirmed. This is the part that made me sick to my stomach, that one of the officers actually shared pictures of Tyree beaten and bloody with five or more people. Now, am I friends, wrong to right? think? It's like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, right? Hey, look what I did. Look at me, big tough guy. I, I had a guy with his arms, you know, handcuffed behind his back, 150 pounds, and I beat the shit out of him. Wow, you're the man, right? You're the man. Am I wrong to think that where this smoke, this fire here? Man, we saw it. There's not, there's not, there's fire, and we saw the fire, and it's, it was fucking uh, disgusting. We now, it was, it was interesting because of the weird jumble of cameras, it wasn't so vivid, but they'll, they'll, there'll be an interesting uh, battle at trial because they'll put together a better, clearer, um, uh, sort of more linear presentation, and there'll be a fight about whether it goes in. But man, and then the other thing about it so the, the incredible violence, but also, as best we can tell, he really did nothing. I've done some of these cases. I worked on Rodney King. When Rodney, you know, that first encounter with Rodney King, the cops had a right to be, you know, uh, trying to stop him. As best we can tell, that wasn't, you know, he Tyree Nichols did nothing. And even worse, it's the worst policing you can imagine because when you get the tape, you know, policing 101 gives clear, specific commands, et cetera. They're holding his hands and saying, give us your hands. They're put, they're saying different contradictory stuff. He didn't have a chance. I mean, if, if he wanted to comply, he couldn't have. It is a absolutely repugnant uh, situation in many different ways. And of course, not le- mostly, mostly the absolute, you know, savagery of the, of the violence based on Basically nothing. Really a foul, foul crime. Absolutely. Well, look, Harry, thank you as always for joining me. Thank Thank you you for your perspective, for your... You know, for your wonderful points of view, I can't believe we've <laughs> actually went for over a little over an hour without really disagreeing with one another. I this know. is fantastic. What is what's this one coming to? That way, next time we'll get a good brouhaha. There you go, Harry. Thank you so much, my friend. You have a good one. Thank you, Mike. You too. And I'll see you bye soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. See buddy. you soon.